Knowles on the News. Susan Knowles. And welcome, everyone, to Stand for Truth Radio's special edition of Knowles on the News. Well, as in other weeks, this is no exception. This is another busy week with a ton of things happening and also a ton of things not being reported in the news. I mean, I don't know how long it's going to be before we really get used to the fact that we're not being told a lot or what we are being told is exactly what they want us to believe and not what really necessarily is the truth. And that's why it is so important for us to always remember that we must continue to do research and delve into things on our own so that we know exactly what's happening. The AP this week is uh, reporting that the Russians, yeah, this will, I know this will shock you, or to be more exact, Russian smugglers may be involved in selling nuclear weapons to ISIS in order to, I don't know, let's get a good word here, destroy America. Oh, my gosh. Um, It said authorities working with the FBI in Eastern Europe have interrupted four attempts in the past five years of gangs trying to sell radioactive material to Middle Eastern extremists, in other words, ISIS. And believe it or not, and I know you do believe it, I'm being very sarcastic here, there is a lucrative black market in the nuclear materials in a small and economically poor country of Moldova in Eastern Europe. Now, the latest attempt to sell the materials occurred in February of this year, and the seller was looking specifically for a buyer from the Islamic State and offered to sell a large cache of potentially radioactive material. Now, the authorities in this small, impoverished country is worried about how the strained relationship between Russia and the United States is making it harder to know if the smugglers are finding ways to move parts of Russia's vast store of radioactive materials and believe that an unknown quantity has already been moved into the black market. Isn't that just wonderful? Now, the authorities there also say that we can expect more of these cases, and he has been associated with the uh, the last four attempts, and he says as long as the smugglers think they can make big money without getting caught, they will keep doing it. Well, you know, finally we found something that we can all come together on and that we all have in common. You know, we always hear, oh, let's just coexist, let's, you know, unity, Love uh, the ISIS and they'll just love you, that type of thing. Well, we finally found something that we can all agree upon. And that is that as long as they think they can make big money and get away with it without getting caught, they're going to keep doing it. That's kind of like a universal thing. So when somebody says, well, what do we all have in common? You can you can just quote that. Now, why should any of this be troubling to us? Well, there are reports that those who have attempted to sell radioactive material on the black markets have escaped, perhaps with the nuclear material. Another another wonderful bit of good news coming our way. And since they're, you know, typically looking for buyers of the uh, Islamic State, those that want to kill us no matter what, and no, they don't love us, and we can't just turn the other cheek and they're going to love us, Those that want to harm us are the ones that are potentially the buyers for these nuclear weapons. Now, it's not the first time, of course, that the United States has been targeted in this way. Uh, Back in 2011, uh, an officer with the Russian FSB, which is previously known as the KGB, I guess they had to change their name. It's kind of like, you know, when you change Common Core and change it to another name so it sounds better, you know, that type of thing. So you won't really know it's the same thing. Well, that's what the Russians did, too. So they led a group that was allegedly seeking to sell bomb-grade uranium, U-235, along with blueprints for a dirty bomb, and they were trying to sell it to a Sudanese man. And according to the wiretaps, the smuggler desperately wanted an Islamic buyer because, as he said, and I quote, they will bomb the Americans. 
see how much they love us. Kind of like almost the same thing as chanting death to America that Iran does, the Iran government. But maybe even better because they can back it up, you know, with their bombs, right? So the kingpin of the operation got away. He's he's gone. He's, you know, not to be found. I'm sure he's actively recruiting and carrying on business. While the kingpin's partner basically is just getting out of prison. Yay! And he's the one that wanted to annihilate America. So I'm sure now that he's getting out of prison, I'm sure that he's reformed and ready to be a great citizen. And you know I'm being sarcastic there. And this information coming from this country and and their judicial authorities and the police there should really send chills down the spines of every American. Why is that, you ask? Well, because our president, Barack Obama, is opening the doors wide to Syrians and to the refugees and wants to resettle them here in the United States, as you know. Wants to bring in like 10,000 more this year and by 2017, another 100,000 people. After hearing this information, not that we didn't already feel that there was uh, something wrong with bringing people into this country that have Islamic ties, but these same refugees that Obama is so willing to open the doors, throw the doors open to, invite them all in and everybody else, anybody and everybody, these same refugees could potentially be carrying this radioactive materials coming from the black market that they got, you know, from potentially Russian connections. So again... You know, how how well are these people being vetted? I would say not very. And what's the potential of them coming in? I'd say pretty high. I'm just guessing. You know, I'm not, not involved in the government or anything else. But, you know, we have seen in the past how diligently this government, this administration, seems to do things. And I, I think it's even more of a reason now, knowing this threat and knowing that over the past several years this has been going on, and we haven't heard anything about it. It's even more of a reason for, reason for Americans to voice their concerns to this administration about the influx of refugees coming in. Now, I, I read something else today saying, gosh, you know, we're, we're not so worried that these people may, you know, be potentially wanting to kill us. No, no, no. We're just worried that the influx of people coming in are going to overwhelm the system within our communities. Really? Where were you when the Central American refugees were coming in and people like in Murrieta, California, were saying, no, get out of here. We don't want you here. And all the criticisms, uh, criticism that was leveled against Murrieta. Where were you at that point? Saying, Gosh, you know what? Maybe Murrieta doesn't want to have the influx into their city because they can't handle all of that many new people coming in with new demands, uh, you know, new health care needs, and every other need under the sun. I mean, these people are, are going to be starting from scratch. And if it's true to anything in the administration before, they're going to bring the people in to wherever, dump them, And tell them, okay, now you show back up when it's time to do X, Y, and Z. And, of course, they're gone for good. And you'll never hear from them again unless and until something horrible happens, God forbid. So, yes, you know, there is going to be. We're going to to repeat what we did, you know, during the summer when people were saying, no, we don't want busloads of people here. We can't handle them. And everybody was called a racist at that point. Oh, you don't want, you know, poor people in your country you know that's not it at all and and you know that and that's what the left does when they want to shut you up and as you may recall recently i wrote an article and i i I told you about this the other day and i'll tell you again you know baltimore when everything went down in baltimore and they were having this horrible time because they were giving space to destroy the mayor was at least, in Baltimore, 
And following this, you know, the rioting and the looting and telling people they could do whatever they wanted, basically, we'll just turn our, we'll just turn our backs. You go ahead, destroy the city, and and we'll be we'll get back to you. And we're not going to. Oh, and by the way, don't worry about the police. We're not going to let them do their jobs. Something like that. But when all of that was happening, you may recall that afterwards, the mayor invited, and I I say that. A little sarcastically, I will have to. This is one of those sarcastic days, so you're just going to hear a lot from me. There's probably going to be a lot of sarcasm because, you know, some days you just get to a point you go, come on, come on. I'm not, I, I can't be the only one who sees this. And of course, I'm not I'm talking to the left here. But the mayor graciously opened the door to allow the DOJ, the Department of Justice, under Loretta Lynch, the U.S. Attorney General. Great person, I'm sure. Uh, Welcome them on into the city. Come on in. Do whatever you need to do. If you need to take over, go for it. I'm going to step out of your way. And Oh, by the way, I'm planning on just stepping down, uh, not not seeking a re-election. in other words. And so I don't really care what you do here in my city. It'll be the remainder of the people that are here that have to really deal with you. So, but come on in and do what you want. And, and boy, did they ever come on in. They brought everybody and, and the kitchen sink and then some in to Baltimore. And then lo and behold, and, and I, I wrote about this because I thought that this was the first step to federalizing the police. I feel that this is, you know, what the Obama administration was trying to do by going into Baltimore and bringing all of their federal personnel in there and saying, hey, you know, we can fix your city, and that's exactly what we're going to do in here. So you, you know, you state, step aside, the federal government is here. And I wrote about that, and I had some people who, you know, took exception to that oh my gosh that's a conspiracy theorist well as i revamped the other day on another article that i wrote um the only thing i missed was i think they are globalizing the police force and in case you missed my earlier little seven minute segment on Knowles on the news what i what i meant by that is that loretta lynch stood up in front of the u.n general assembly and basically started talking about their strong cities network program that they're going to put in place where all the cities will work together and all the states will work together and all the countries will ultimately work together, gosh, all under the auspices, hopefully, of the U.N. And if that should happen, then the Constitution of the United States will be no more under the U.N. See, I told you I was going to be very sarcastic today. But truthful, because... You know, I can see this administration taking step after step after step, taking more and more and more of our constitutional rights away while everybody sits back on the left and and many, unfortunately, on the right who sit back and feel that, oh, come on now, that's, that's conspiracy theorist talk. That's not going to happen. They're not going to take your guns away. They're not going to globalize the police force. They're on your side. The government is here to help. Anyway, I I digress a moment. But following all of that in Baltimore after the DOJ came in, just so happens that we needed a place to put the refugees that were coming in from Syria. And lo and behold, who stepped up to kind of volunteer to say, you know what, our city will take those people. We're not afraid of the fact that they could be Islamists and try to kill us all or, or God forbid, go other places and try to kill other people too. We'll take them all. You got it. It was Baltimore. And I wrote about in my piece saying I, I think Baltimore probably was, you know, returning the favor, so to speak, or maybe obligated to take the Syrians in. And so now, who's going to take 100,000 more by 2017? 
And and I know a lot of people are probably saying, well, don't worry, they'll just kind of get, you know, assimilated into the United States. No, sorry, that doesn't happen anymore. You know, they should take the word out of the dictionary. Nobody assimilates when they come into this country. When you, when people come into this country now, they want their own culture, their own, you know, everything, and 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 that's okay. But the problem is they don't want you to have your culture anymore and they don't want to become a part of your culture, but you darn well better become a part of their culture if you're Islamist. Because as we all know in, in the shows that I do, if, if you're talking about ISIS or someone who follows the Quran to the letter of the law, then you must become an Islamist or hmm, or your life will be over. Let's just put it that way. And if you don't believe me, like I said, you know, I've said many times, go do your own research, go back and listen to the shows I've done with the experts that have come on and said those things. Those aren't my words. Those are words in the Quran. Those are the words that the guests have said. These are experts that have spent time in this subject matter. So, you know, what do we do at this point? Well, I know in the past, you know, getting up and talking about these things, trying to tell Congress this is not what we want, really hasn't helped. And you're right. It really hasn't helped. We have a lot of people who simply in Congress don't listen anymore. They've checked out. You know, they've gotten what they've wanted out of their career path in Congress, and they're really not listening too much to what the people are saying because they know, you, you know, most of the times you're not going to vote them out or they'll stay in for four years. And then by the time it comes around to vote again, whatever the, however the length of time, you'll, will have forgotten. And biggest thing they're hoping for is that you won't go and vote anyway. And as it stands now, a large number of Christians don't vote. They stay at home. And I understand, you know, we've talked about this before too. I understand that you don't like voting sometimes because you feel it doesn't do any good anyway. Well, uh, you know, to ever change the process back to where it, what it used to be, if there was a used to be, it's been so long now, I don't even know what used to be was. But if we're ever going to try to regain anything, we just can't keep going down this same path. And sitting at home is not, going to change anything and you know we have an opportunity now trying to get a new speaker of the house and if we are very unfortunate we'll get kevin mccarthy from california and what we do need is somebody who is willing to do what the american public wants them to do so we're just going to have to see what happens and it may turn out not in our favor. You know, it's it's been so long now not in our favor. It's kind of hard to kind of get your enthusiasm up. I realize that. But a lot of people, just like myself, a long time ago, when they were trying to get rid of Boehner, kept saying, you know, and I called up my representative, Duncan Hunter. I'm like, you need to go in there and you need to vote Boehner off as Speaker of the House. And, you know, of course, I didn't get to speak to Duncan Hunter because he's got a gatekeeper. But the gatekeeper said, well, right now it looks as though he's, you know, he's not going to be voting that way. Well, you know, then what are you doing there? You know, if, if now Dun- I have a lot of respect for Duncan Hunter and his father. I really do in helping the military and what they do. But, if you know, if you're not there to do your job and stand up, and, and I'm, I don't know about you, Guys, but I I am really sick and tired of hearing, well, I really can't do that because if I make people mad, they will throw me off of this this committee and that committee and I can't do what I want to do and need to do for the people. I'm sorry, but you're not really doing what you need to do for the people anyway, so I really don't care if you're getting kicked off the committee. What I do care about is the fact that you were sent there to do a job. And I want you to do it the best that you can. And if that means you don't get to, you know, 
sit at the big seat, play with the big boys, or, you know, go on a golf tournament because you've been ousted. I don't care. I really don't care. It's, again, I, and we've said this over and over on this show, it's not about this world, it's about the next. So I want you to go in there and do what you know is the right thing to do. And, and I, I, would, I would guess that 9 out of 10 people in Congress were raised to do the right thing and they know what they know right from wrong don't don't sit there and tell me you don't know right from wrong go in there and do the right thing and i'll have to tell you you know i know everybody wanted trey gowdy uh to be speaker of the house and i and i get that because you know his the his craft and his skill level is just amazing to watch you know he's one of those guys that you just do not want to go up against it, he's brutal and and that's really a good thing but I, I will have to say i read something today that i was really disappointed in and and that is that you know trey gowdy was saying that if he had to vote for somebody that could sort of help us like maybe start over and would be the best pick and all that he actually said paul ryan and and i was floored by that i I, you know, Paul Ryan is the uh, the VP candidate running mate for Mitt Romney. For me, he was very disappointing. He may know some things about economics and you know financial stuff, but I question that even. But I can't see him in any type of leadership role that could help turn this country around. I'm sorry, I just can't. And when Trey Gowdy said that, I was kind of shocked. I'm like, let me go back and reread this. Do I have this right? And I know he's had a little falling out with Kevin McCarthy because McCarthy came out and said, well, this Benghazi committee is really hurting Hillary in the, in the polls. And now, of course, everybody on the left is, ah, oh, see there, I thought it, I told you it was just a witch hunt. That's all it is. I mean, you know, Hillary is just as, as, as pure as a driven snow. She's done nothing wrong ever and, 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 and never will. What is so sad in all of this, and I really think that you feel the same way, most of you at least, is that four people died in Benghazi. And we haven't, we haven't done anything to bring justice to that. And everybody, everybody knows, you know, you, you just, it's one of those things that in your gut, you just know, you know, the, the truth there. And we just can't seem to do anything about it. It's, it's almost like some of these, these hearings are just, are just for show. And I'm not saying that they're put on for that reason, I'm just saying they end up being that. It's it's all great. We all get behind, you know, when they're talking to Hillary or whoever they're talking to and they're they're just grilling them. You know, you, you're sitting there going, yeah, yeah, yes, this is great. And it turns out nothing happens. You know, there, there was a time in our history when you saw justice served. And I don't know, I... I haven't seen that in so long, in my opinion, that I'm really starting to lose hope in the system. And especially under, you know, this administration of ever seeing any wrong righted. And so I guess that brings us to the next question. You know, it is, is Donald Trump the savior? Is he the one that's going to save America? You know, if we... If it's not Trey Gowdy's pick of Paul Ryan, is it Donald Trump? Is there a possibility that all of this could be real, that Donald Trump holds the key? You know, I said before that one of the things that bothers me about Donald Trump is is the fact of the little personal attacks. Because I know it, it plays for good TV, but it doesn't play for good presidential candidate material. And I think he really has to start seriously thinking about laying off of that type of thing, being more presidential, not a politician, but just being more professional and presidential as we move forward. We've, we've had enough of the, of the presidents who don't really seem to appreciate the position 
and what this country really is and who we are as a country. And I think that every time that Donald Trump attacks whoever it is on that 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 small type of stuff, you know, in Carly Fiorina's face or uh, whomever, Megyn Kelly and something about her, you, not that he might not think that, not that some of us might not think that, whatever, but I think there are some things that are probably best left unsaid. And I think he's starting to maybe realize that. According to this article in the Washington Post, it says after a summer of dominating the Republican presidential uh, campaign, Donald Trump is moving into a new and and uncertain phase. And even Donald Trump now says that it will be more challenging than any project he has ever undertaken. And he sat down with an hour-long interview. And he said that uh, he's far from satisfied from what he has accomplished to date. Now, everybody seems to re- really want to accuse him quickly of being this egotistical, narcissistic human being. Partially, that's true. He does have a huge ego, and that's why he is as successful as he is. But, you know, when he's talking right there, when he talks about not being satisfied with what he's done to date... That's a little bit of a calming down from the ego of where he was. He says, if you don't win, what have I done? I've wasted time. He said, I want to make America great again. And you can't do that if you come in in a close second. You know, I like that attitude. I, I like somebody who says, I want to win. Now, I know those people who don't like Donald Trump are going to be saying, now, don't be fooled. You know, Donald Trump doesn't mean what he says. He's... He's a a progressive, big government, on and on and on. You know, while some of that may be true, again, it's hard to find the alternative when the alternative isn't stating who they are. We have seen Ben Carson come out and talk lately and loved his... uh, his talk on the, on the view, I I don't know why he would go on the view, but I mean, he, he was on the view and he didn't let them railroad him, which I'm sure they were all just chomping at the bit, especially Joey Behar before the show started, couldn't wait to get her teeth into Ben Carson. And, you know, good for him. He stood his ground and made a lot of sense, which is probably more than they've heard on the view in good gosh, you know, since it started. Now, they said that he laid out for the first time in detail the elements of what will be the second chapter of his, you know, presidential campaign bid, signaling an evolution toward a somewhat more traditional campaign. I'm all for that as long as traditional campaign means cutting out the, you know, the rhetoric of the attacks, the personal attacks. If we're, if we're going to move more into sounding like a political candidate, I'm not too happy with that. But we'll have to see. Now, apparently, Trump is preparing his first television ads with a media firm uh, that is new to politics, which is probably going to be very refreshing. So I'm gonna, I think I'm going to be looking forward to that. We'll see. His wife, Melania, and Ivanka, his daughter, are planning public appearances highlighting women's health issues to help uh, close Trump's empathy gap with female voters. I I didn't know there was an empathy gap. You know, little do you know, when you wake up every day, there's something new. Now, I don't know how affected Ivanka and uh, Melania are going to be, you know, to the typical average everyday American. And I hope they put them in jeans or, you know, take off a lot of the makeup and probably leave the, the the diamonds and the gold at home would probably be a good move. So that's going to be interesting to see how that works out. I hope it does, but it will be interesting. And they said also that Trump is publishing a book and planning to roll out policies on reforming the Department of Veterans Affairs. Now, I, I know some veterans are kind of skeptical about whether or not Donald Trump has their best interest at heart, but Honestly, how many other candidates have you heard specifically talking about targeting and reforming, you know, the Department of Veterans Affairs? I I really haven't. I mean, I know that some of them have helped out 
think Marco Rubio has helped out uh, with the Department of Veteran Affairs and, and helping the veterans, not the, not the Department of Veteran Affairs, but in, in certain cases. But to actually say let's reform the VA, I I haven't heard a candidate speak like that. As I've said on this show before, you know the the VA has been horrible. Uh, for as far back as I can remember, nothing has been good about it. And people are still talking about how horrible it is. So that would, I'm sure, would be a welcome breath of fresh air. And he's also talking about trade and China's currency manipulations. He is deepening his political organization far beyond the early states with top advisors vowing that his fight for the nomination will go all the way to the floor of the Republican National Convention. Well, good for him. Good for him. Now, he's mostly self-funding his campaign and said he'd originally budgeted up to $20 million through mid-September for television advertising, but so far he's not spent anything to go on the airwaves since he is so often on them. And even better. I don't necessarily, I don't know about you, I don't like looking at those attack ads and watching them. I I could do without them. I, I wish they would spend the money on something else. It would be better if they just go on and instead of having this ad with, you know, so-and-so has done this and, and da 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 you know, just, just talk. Tell us who you are. Tell us what you're trying to do. Tell us why you would make a, a great presidential candidate and a great president. I really think that more money should be spent on those type of things rather than these silly ads that just get worse and worse as time goes on. Now, his campaign says it's hired a Florida-based advertising firm. Trump said he has proposed several concepts for ads in the work. In the works, I've had such a great concept. In fact, so good, Trump said, declining to specify. So, <laughs> the ego comes out again. Um, they said that they would likely spend considerably more than $20 million on paid media later this year, whatever it takes. He said the spots would be non-traditional, again good, saying the firm which he and Trump declined to name has never created political ads. This should be interesting. It really should be interesting. Because you're going to see the same old ads coming out from Hillary and, and Bernie Sanders and anybody else who's running the same tired old attack ads. And, you know, I, I hope, I, I know Trump is probably going to do some of that I, I, because everybody does. But if it's not traditional, then maybe he won't. But we've already seen him do things like, you know, deliver water to Marco Rubio with a towel you know, again, okay, I can kind of go along with that. It's locker room, you know, bantering, basically. That's kind you know, it's a little bit, uh, not so great to spend your time on that, but okay, I'll give you that. But, well, you know, it'll be interesting to see what they actually do. And apparently his new book is called Crippled America. That's, you know, that's a good title because everybody really, I think, feels that's about where we are right now. He said, it's actually the hardest I've worked on a book since the art of the deal, referring to his 87 bestseller. I don't want to have a stupid statement in the book that people are going to say, hey, what did, why did he say that? Again, good that he's looking out for what he's saying and trying to make it something that he knows the American people want and not that he's trying to trick them but I, I mean I, I'm starting to feel you know in the beginning I wasn't sure I'm really starting to feel that he's a little more genuine in what he's saying and a little bit more I don't know it, it's like he's seen the tide that's moving and he's gotten more respect you know for the position and more respect for what he's doing and I like to see that. I don't know where he's going to go with it. And you know, there's a lot of time left. But we'll see. And he says, now here we go back, you know, to who Trump really is, I guess. He says he does not believe the next stage of the campaign will require him to change his flamboyant confrontational style, which has captivated the attention of voters, whether they support him or not. Again, we could, at least I could, do without the confrontational style when it is a hit below the belt. I don't care if you stand up to North Korea, China, anybody else. Go for it. 
but try to maybe not go so much after personal things on the candidates. All I'm saying. And I guess he noted that running for president has brought pressures and demands that he didn't expect or didn't even experience in the business world and had not anticipated in the political arena. Frankly, I don't know how he does it all. And I don't know what's going to happen with his businesses when and if he becomes president. That'll be interesting. I think Ivanka and his son will have to uh, stand up and do, do a little bit more. Uh, he went on to say it's been very unforgiving. If you make a mistake, that can be very easily explained. It can still be turned around. And then you have three bad days of press over something that actually wasn't even a big deal. I think everybody in public office has understands exactly what he's saying. And I guess what he's saying, too, is that he doesn't want to change who he is and how he presents himself to the public. He's going to be who he's going to be. He says it's going to be the same thing. You've got to have a personality. You've got to be able to speak your mind. You've got to have some thoughts that are correct. And I guess then he's also, it's also that he believes there's going to be about four or five people past New Hampshire. And his advisors are working to assure that Trump will qualify for the ballot in all 50 states and the U.S. territories. Which I can't even imagine them, the work that they have to go through. Uh, so, you know, so far I think he's doing, I think he's doing really, really well. And I know sometimes the polls come out and say, well, he's slipping and, 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 and on and on and on. Oh, he's behind Ben Carson and oh gosh, it's not going to be long now. All the people who are hoping that he will just drop out of the race. And I, I, again, I really wish those people would just stop spending so much time and effort on hoping that Donald Trump will fall out of the race and, and, and spend more time. If you've got a better candidate, let us know who that candidate is. So far, the candidates that, that are talking, other than Ted Cruz, I, you know, I've told you all along, I like Ted Cruz. I really do. He's a constitutionalist. And I feel that he's probably one of the most honest candidates that we have running. Outside of that, I, you know, I'm not sold on anybody yet. I really don't, I don't have a particular candidate. I know that Carly Fiorina, you know, things keep coming out about her and how her organization, you know, has given money to Planned Parenthood. And there's some argument that, well, they, you don't necessarily know who, who uh, you're giving money to. And while I understand that, I don't think the public is as forgiving of Fiorina as they would be of Trump. And I have to say that some of it, I think, is due from her days in HP. And, you know, whatever, good, bad, or indifferent, there are a lot of people... Uh, that I've heard talk about how uh, they're coming out and saying, you know, how horrible it was working for her and how they lost their jobs. And some of that, I have to tell you, we know when there's a reorganization, people lose jobs. If, if you have to reorganize a business in order to save it, if that was the case, it's part of business. And it's not a nice part of business. And, and I know people wish that would never happen, but it does. And you can't have a business that's running itself into the ground and continue to do basically the same thing over and over and expect a different result. So if some people got laid off or whatever the case may be because Hewlett Packard needed to do that, I get that. And again, it's unfortunate, but that's the reality of the situation. And this week there was some a little glimpse of hope. A glimmer. A a glimpse would be too much. Glimmer might be a little bit more accurate. But there was like a little glimmer of hope for the Republicans because they got to see something that they haven't seen in quite some time. Senators overcame a filibuster on the annual defense policy bill Tuesday, delivering, drumroll, a significant victory to Republicans and teeing up a battle with President Obama over a threatened veto on the bill, which does everything from raising troops' pay to setting policy for Guantanamo Bay detainees. Now, before you get too excited, we have a long way to go. You know, because the Republicans typically, right after this point, this is where they cave. (laughs) 
it, they talk a big talk. They get, you know, over some hurdle, which, again, I know that's a big deal. They haven't gotten over a hurdle in, in so long. I mean, normally they've caved long before now. But they got to this point. They averted a filibuster. And what they would like to do um, is have this go to the desk of Obama eventually and have him veto it because it's going to make him look bad. Well, pff, does he really care? <laughs> does, I mean, look at what he's done as far as the military is concerned. Will he care that this makes him look bad? I don't know. I've got my doubts. I mean, we've had so many generals and so many at the top that have been fired, dismissed, whatever you want to call it, from the military. We've had so many things happening and changing the military, bringing in, uh, you know, women into the front lines, uh, transgenders, uh, you know, just overhauling the military, perhaps, and not allowing them to pray necessarily, uh, is one more thing. I mean, this is like minor. <laughs> As compared to everything else, this is minor. And troops pay. What are we talking about? A 1% raise? I don't know. And and here's what John McCain has to say. So listen up, because I'm sure that whenever John McCain speaks, you want to hear exactly what he has to say, just like I do. I cannot imagine a president of the United States vetoing a bill that authorizes the ability of Americans to defend this nation under these most challenging circumstances. Oh, John, imagine it. And it says, if Mr. Obama follows through on his threat to veto, it would present the best chance yet for Congress to override him, which would take a two-thirds vote in each chamber. There appears right now, to be more than enough support in the Senate, which voted 73 to 26 Tuesday, to head off a filibuster. From the Democratic caucus, 21 members sided with Republicans. Okay, that's really good. But will they stick to that, or will Obama invite them out for golf, or call them up and say, hey, you know, I've been meaning to invite you to play basketball lately. And I just haven't gotten around to it. But why don't you come on and let's go out and do that. We, we really need to get to know each other a little bit better. You know. And, and bring, ooh, I don't know, 21 of your, 20 of your best friends with you. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not as hopeful as maybe, you know, maybe as the Republicans would want me to be. Or maybe as I should be. I'm not holding my breath on this one just like every other one. I'm not going to hold my breath because I've been disappointed so many times before. Speaking about disappointment and politicians that disappoint, we have Jerry Brown as our governor of California. And and as you know, I, I keep hoping and praying that Jerry Brown is going to decide to run president of the United States and get into the campaign because I want the rest of the country to know what it's like to have this person in power this week let's see what Jerry's been busy this week Jerry signed the assisted suicide bill so now in California you can uh, you can get help if you want to kill yourself because of an illness. So he signed that. And I believe in the past he has failed to sign that. But this time, Jerry said he considered his own life in making that decision of whether or not to, to sign that bill. Do you, I don't know if we don't know something that he's not telling us. I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe because he's older now, he really thinks differently about it. So there you go. For those of you who are for that, you got Jerry Brown. And for those of us who are against that, we still have Jerry Brown. Now, what else did Jerry do this week? Well, Jerry signed another bill. And this one is just, I can't wrap my mind around it. I don't don't know what's going to happen in this. Imagine, if you will, there's a trolley like they have in San Francisco, the trolley cars. 
And sitting around the trolley are 15 people sitting around the outside of the trolley on these little bar stools. And there's a little bar, you know, a a silver bar to actually hold on to so you don't fall off. And there is a, there's a hole that's down in the, the wood part of the actual bar where you would drink from on the bar. And there's a, it's a cup holder. So what happens is, and I think this is only in San Francisco and San Diego now. I can't imagine what it would be like in San Francisco just because of the hills there, but 15 people get onto this trolley car looking thing and they pedal while somebody inside steers it. And hopefully somebody inside knows how to work the brakes, especially if you're in San Francisco. But they're going to pedal their little hearts out around to about three different bars in the area And I'm not sure what happens next. I mean, it's odd to me because, you know, if you drink at a restaurant and you have alcohol, you're in California, you're not allowed to walk away from the little sidewalk table. You're not allowed to leave the premises in in any way. And so this trolley thing bike mobile, whatever it's called is going to roll on up there. And they're going to be served alcohol. And then they're going to, when they're done, they're going to pedal themselves on down to the next bar. So I'm hoping that the the person who's driving the trolley bike, whatever, is not drinking. I'm, I'm sure that's a little designated driver who's working for the company of, of this contraption. And, you know, off they go on their merry way down to the next bar. Pedal, 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 down to the next bar. (laughs) Now, it's just so odd because in San Diego, they have these little, I don't don't know what they call them, pedicabs or whatever. You bicycle around. There's one guy bicycles and two people sit sort of in the back, you know. And they they pedal you around all over San Diego and charge you lots of money. But a lot of these people, sometimes they get run over by cars because people, they just don't watch. They don't look where they're going. And... People have died on them, unfortunately. So I can't imagine you have this big pedaling maniac type vehicle uh, and going around town. And, this, and you know it's Friday night. You know it has to be on Friday night when it's very busy. And downtown San Diego, you know, all the bars are kind of together. But it's really busy down there. They really, you know, I hate to say this, but they really need to, to close off some of those streets. Because people drive like crazy down there. It's so crowded. People are trying to go from bar to bar, crossing the streets, and it's just, it's crazy. So hopefully, you know, you're not going to have people with an accidents down there with this, with this thing. And, you know, the cab drivers don't even like the little pedicabs. I don't know how they're going to like this. When you've got 15 people that you're losing, lo- losing the, you know, business from. <laughs> so you get that and, and couple that with the fact, okay, here's the part I don't understand. Again, you know, unless they go around and make sure that everybody has finished the alcohol in their little cups and they go on to their next location, you're leaving the premises again and you have alcohol. And and also, what's going to prevent someone from perhaps, you know, a kid runs up to the little trolley and they hand them their drink. Here you go, kid, you know. I mean, anybody could say, well, that could happen at a restaurant. Yeah, I guess it could, but it's usually more enclosed and people are watching and on and on and on. So that's that was Jerry Brown's other accomplishment this week. Let's hand for Jerry. Yay, Jerry. So glad this is your last time and you don't get to run again. I'm thrilled about that, as a matter of fact. And then Jerry, gosh, you know, Jerry did other things that I'm sure that he is so proud of this week. He signed a bill. Now, I know this is going to come as a surprise. But he signed a bill, a major climate change bill, to boost renewables and building efficiency. Wow, Jerry, great. And and not that that's going to cost the taxpayers any more money, I'm sure. You know, everybody who is making... 
I don't know, over a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year have already gone anyway because they they saw the writing on the wall and they just got out. You know, let's get out before California implodes on itself and there's nothing left. I mean, as it is now, we pay out the nose for everybody who who is here illegally. Uh, we pay for, I don't know, I, I, I think... We pay for just about everything out of pocket. I mean, seriously, our after Obamacare, everything went up and everything locally, you know, went up. It just it just keeps on going up. And we have probably uh, one of the highest gas taxes here in California. Every you know the story. And I can hear most of you saying now, well, leave California. Yeah, if it were that easy, you know, if it were only that easy. Um, and there are people here in California who don't like it. They really don't. Not all of us in California think it's all a good idea. But we're kind of outnumbered. We used to be very conservative here all over, especially in Southern California. But that has really changed. And even San Diego, once very, very conservative, has now become very liberal. And let's move on to Detroit. Now, did you hear what happened in Detroit over the weekend, I think it was? They erected a statue to Satan. I kid you not. Broad daylight, bite people on down. Let's just erect a statue to Satan. While at the same time in Oklahoma, I believe it was, under the cover of darkness... They removed the Ten Commandments. Why? Oh, gosh. You know, we wanted to do this at night because we were afraid of traffic. We didn't want la, 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 la. So, in other words, America, we're in deep trouble. I don't, I don't remember a time ever that we've ever in this country erected a statute to Satan. And... I haven't heard too much about it. People just kind of go on like, oh, well, it's just a statue to Satan. Yeah, I've seen those, seen them here, seen them there. No big deal. And then we take away the Ten Commandments under the cover of darkness. And, you know, in some ways, I have to say, it makes me happy. You know why? Because it shows you how much more powerful God is than Satan. If you have to do that under cover of darkness at night, taking out the Ten Commandments, you knew what was going to happen. You knew people would be there and they would be protesting that and it would not be pretty. And that's why you did it under a cover of darkness because God is more powerful. He brings more people than Satan would ever bring. So, you know what? Keep on doing your stuff in the cover of darkness. I, I, if I were in Detroit right now, I literally, I would be trying to find a way out of there. I would go anywhere that I could. And, you know, do I think everybody in Detroit wanted that? No. Do I think that people stood up in Detroit and said we don't want that? I don't know. I hope they did. And I, you know, I, I would get out of there as fast as I could. It is Not going to bode well. I know Detroit has major problems now. I can't even imagine what kind of issues are going to come down the pike with that statute in your community like that. It's, It's a scary time that we live in. We really do. When, you know, we, I see things about you know, gun control almost every day. Hillary, oh, if I'm elected, I'm going to really get serious about gun control. You know, Hillary's going to take guns away, whatever. And at the same time, this woman, you know, in the back of my head, I'm going, you received the Margaret Sanger Award. You understand what that means. Margaret Sanger, who felt that different races, particularly black African Americans, that they were inferior and she wanted to get rid of them. And here you stand, Hillary, talking about getting rid of guns after you've accepted the Margaret Sanger Award and then watching and knowing what Planned Parenthood does. It, it, 
I mean, any sane person would have difficulties trying to just take a hold of that with your mind and, and, and keep sane after you hear that. I mean, if you didn't understand who the progressives were and you didn't understand what they were trying to do, it, it might surprise you. It, it doesn't surprise me, but it really, it, at times, you're like, whoa, did I really hear that? D- did I really hear that? And unfortunately, yeah, you really did hear that. You know, and finally, I, I want to talk to you a little bit. I've started a GoFundMe campaign at Stanford Truth Radio. I'm, I'm trying to do a children's book. The left has been training and teaching our children for hundreds, or about 100 years or more. And they have really turned them away from our morals and what we believe our children, and how they should be taught. And if we don't start doing that on the right, then we're never going, we're going to lose our children forever. Because it's just, there's too much. Too much stacked against us. And I've written a children's book. I'm trying to get the illustrations and the marketing and the publishing for it. I have a GoFundMe account up asking you to donate if you feel led to donate to this cause i don't want to just write one book children's book i want to write many of them you know i have a background i'm a licensed psychotherapist i've worked with children i understand children and i understand their needs and what they need to hear from conservatives in order to maintain the life the life that we want them to have and who we want them to be if we don't have our material out there for them to see and for them to learn from then the only materials that they are going to see are from those on the left the progressive left that's it that's all they are going to see and it's not going to be where they grow up and go oh wow you know i guess that was all wrong these they're brainwashed (laughs) from kindergarten on up with the progressive left materials for the most part. And we have to start very young in trying to get them to remain conservative, remain with our morals, our values. So if it's something that you feel led to give to, I really hope that you would consider doing that. Again, there's a GoFundMe account set up, uh, Stanford Truth Radio, Susan Knowles, look for either one. And it is a children's book. I'm going to try to put it on my website. It's SusanKnowles.com. Try to embed it there somehow. Uh, If you want to also donate and you can't find it, you can write me at Susan at SusanKnowles.com. K-N-O-W-L-E-S.com. And I would be more than happy to give you the link. I've also been tweeting it out and I've been putting it on Facebook. Uh, This money will be used for a good cause, I promise you. It is something that I've been thinking about for a long time. I really feel led to do this, and I have really been avoiding doing it because I know the cost of of hiring illustrators, really good illustrators, to do something. And, And unfortunately, with a lot of these children's books, you know, kids like to see pictures, and you have to have them or they just don't sell. And if you don't, sell the book and and nobody reads them then that defeats the purpose so hopefully you will go and check that out i I know that you would love the book it's got a lot of great conservative christian principles to it and again it's something that will balance what they are getting from the progressive left and it's coming at them every day all day and we're not doing the same things so i hope that you will join with me in that and i just want to say that i so much appreciate the fact that you come here every week twice a week at times and and listen to my show it really means a lot to me i am really trying to do programming and bringing on the best guests that i can find for you and giving you information that i really feel that you and your family need to have in order to navigate where we are at this time and this point in time in in our lives and in this world and in history and i 
I value your opinion and your coming and reading my articles and being here for this show. It means a lot. And I know that you are people that go out and help others and you make a difference in people's lives. And I want you to know you make a difference in my life. You really do. And I hope that in some small way that I have returned that to you. Until next week, take care of yourself. Be good to yourself. And I'll see you then. God bless.